Thank you. Thanks for introduction and thank you for having me here. And more importantly, thank you for organizing this event. I must say that that's one of the things that uh, I hope it continues after the whole pandemic ends, hopefully one day. And it's not one new thing to be to give me end of pandemic anxiety. So I, I really, really have been enjoying these talks and uh, seminar series, and I would I would be great to have them in some form in the future. Thank you so much for organizing it in a, such a nice, uh, a smooth way. We are, many of us are enjoying that. Uh, and I'm happy to give the talk for today. So my talk is in uh, orders in quartic number fields. And I must specify that I only will talk about monogenic orders that I will define soon. Uh, so uh, K will be a number field for me. and. Uh, for most of this talk, I will focus on quartic number fields, number fields of degree four. And uh, O will be any order in that number field. And I will call the order monogenic if it can be generated by one element as a Z algebra. So, uh, and that uh, element alpha, which would be an algebraic integer, is uh, I call it monogenizer. And uh, the main point of uh, the one new thing that I will try to give you the proof of would be if a, an order has a monogenizer, how many more monogenizer it can have. So if I already know an order is, uh, is monogenic, how many ways I can monogenize it. So some trivial comments about this. Of course, if uh, or the order was like generated by element alpha, if I add any rational integer, then, then uh, that would be another generator. And so I'm not looking for that. I, this way I can have infinitely many generators. And the same thing with the sign of plus minus. So I'm not worried about that. So I'm looking for non-trivial generators of the same order. And uh, we do know a lot of things about monogenic orders and the number of their monogenizations. A very, very important fact comes from a work of Dury in 1976 that uh, where he proved that an order has at most finitely many uh, monogenizations. And I, now here we talk about a general order. Of course, it might have zero. That's not a monogenic order. But if it does have mono, if, if it's monogenic, it definitely the number of ways you can do that, the number of different, essentially different alphas that do that for you are going to be finite. So this fact we know. And as I said, my, uh, my whole goal is to talk about more quantitative results, like how many ways or what is the maximum ways possible that you could do that. And even for that, there are very, very strong results. So uh, for example, uh, a result of Ivertse and Guri uh, tells, tells us how many for a general degree n, so k here is of degree n. So for a number field in a number field k of degree n, if you have a monogenic order, then there are these at most these many ways that you can do uh, monogenization. So there are different alpha, beta, or say alpha one, alpha two, and so on. So that are not, uh, that are not coming from addition of uh, rational integers. And of course, this is a, this is a really impressive work. I, I, wrote, I wrote the title of their paper in 1985, uh, to emphasize on the methods that have used, the, the methods are based on unit form equations that I just hint on a little bit. And of course, even when you look at their papers, they don't expect this to be sharp, but the, uh, the main point here was that they could come up with a number with an upper bound that, uh, that tells you that you can't, you can't have more than this. And it's so general, it works for every number. Uh, better results were established by Iverse. Um, and that band was uh, was improved, like uh, the paper is, I think, published 2011. So that's the improvement of the band they had with uh, Giori before. So if I if my degree of number field is four, this I think gives me two times two to the power 72. And my goal here is just to work on this theorem and just just only one this one result 
and try to improve this bond a little bit. My, the bond that I can uh, produce, it's, um, let me see. I think that if I have to be exact for most of, uh, for all of the, um, uh, for any orders in a quartic number field, I can come up with 2,760. So I can replace this by this. And uh, uh, for orders of, uh, for orders of discriminant large enough, which would be almost all orders, all, uh, all orders, except finitely many of them, I can improve this bond to 182. And that's, that's, uh, that's gonna be the, the only new thing I show you today. Of course, the method I'm using, there's hope that I can do a little bit more, uh, produce more theorems, but, but uh, just improving this bound would be my goal for today. The rest of the talk would be to give you some background on the, in this area and just tell you how I come up with this. Uh, as I said, I will, uh, I will, uh, uh, I will uh, talk more about this uh, and uh, give you exactly how I reduce this problem to some Diophantine equations, and then I have upper bounds for uh, the number of solutions for those Diophantine equations, and I just use that those reductions to come up with this, but. In order to give you, especially those people who are experts and sitting here, to give you what is going to happen at the end, what's going to happen is that I take a, a, I, a, I, to count the number of monogenizers, I'm going to reduce the problem to one cubic two equations that will be defined soon. And then every solution of that cubic two equation will give me a quartic two equations. And then we have very nice bounds for two, especially cubic and quartic equations. And I'm gonna multiply those bounds and give you the bounds that I wrote here. So that would be the outline of my proof. But before getting there, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna talk about some uh, classical Diophantine equations that are naturally very related to that field. I have one almost empty page on uh, uh, one almost empty page on uh, unit equations. And I, that's all I, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I wondered, of is course. there a conjectured lower bound for, for ones that actually are monogenic? So you, can you get like greater than greater than something that grows quickly in N or linear in N? So lower bound for the number of monogenizers. Yeah. Um, Nothing in general that I know, but uh, when I talk about a cubic, then whatever uh, lower bound we have for cubic uh, two equations that have a representation of one would be exactly that. That's not even conjecture. And I think that most of cubic two equations that occur this way have exactly one solution. So that would be one monogenizer. But generally, I do not know if there is lower bound. My guess is that my guess is that most of them, no, I don't, I actually, I don't want to guess, but no, I don't know of any okay. conjectural lower bounds. Sorry you. about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so unit equation, I'm just going to define it for people who don't know them. And just because it's very essential in this area, basically every result that I showed you right now and any other meaningfully uh, different, like new result that we have seen in the area of uh, monogenic orders, especially those who are counting somehow the number of monogenizers or so on, depends on techniques that coming from the theory of unit form equations. And just to have, to give you an idea, it's, it's a very, very simple equation. You work in a number field and your coefficients alpha and beta are two, let's say two members of your number field and you look at, you search for X and Y's that are unit in your number field and you wanna see if there is any solution to that, if there is such solution, how many there can be. And you use the structure, the finitely generated structure of your unit group. But it's, uh, even though it's very simple looking, it's, uh, it's not an easy question to answer. And, but this has been the, uh, the techniques that are coming here has been really under, uh, like they have been used in the work of, especially work of Guri, Guri and Iverse, Iverse. 
alone. So they they used all of uh, unit uh, unit form unit equations and also s unit equations to answer that. And the idea is that assuming two uh, monogenizers, they work with their conjugates and find units in appropriate number fields and make them satisfy equation an equation of this shape and then deal with the difficulty that comes uh, from solving such equation to give you some quantitative result. But this is not something I will use in this new theorem that I'm talking about. So I just wanted to tell you that uh, uh, this, these are very common method uh, to use. Uh, let's uh, start with uh, quadratic number field. In quadratic number field case, for many years, we know the answer to this. Actually, every order is monogenic and it's uniquely monogenic. And you know that a uh, number D appears as discriminant if it's zero or one mod four. And for every number D you can find, write a, un a unique order that, uh, uh, that uh, is this and th that there is essentially one way to monogenize this uh, order. So this has been known. Uh, orders in uh, cubic number fields, I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> stating a very new theorem here that the contents of it and also the, the methods of it have nothing to do with my talk today, but it's very, very recent. They posted this result in November 22, and I love the title. So I wrote the title for you here so that I don't have to say anything. The title say, but they are proving. You saw in, uh, in a quadratic case, every order was monogenic, but you mo moving from quadratic to cubic case, everything changed. And they actually could prove that a positive proportion of orders cannot be monogenized in any ways. And I think that, uh, I think that the, probably the, many people conjecture that most of orders are uh, not monogenic, uh, but they do, have, uh, they do have a nice proof uh, uh, to, to, to say that uh, a positive proportion of them and they order their, they order their orders with their discriminants. Uh, so uh, they prove that a positive proportion of them are not monogenic at all. So, and for that reason, many of you might not be, uh, might not be very interested in monogenic orders because if you actually believe there are not so many of them, why would I prove anything about them? But of course, uh, of course, there are infinitely many of them. If if you take any algebraic integer, so if you take any alpha and OK, then then you just write z joined alpha, and you made a, a monogenic order. So uh, still, you have infinitely many of them, and such results. Probably the many people uh, believe that should hold for any number fields, like a positive proportion or maybe almost 100% of orders in any number field K should not be monogenic, but we just uh, started to understand this for sure for cubic uh, fields and for quartic fields, there are conjectures, but there's nothing close to this conjecture. Uh, let me go back to a general case uh, for, uh, for the moment, like if, I have a, a general number field K. How do I think of uh, orders? And especially how do, I, mm, how do I write my questions that I'm asking today in an equation? What kind of equation can I solve to, to get some of my questions answered? One of these uh, equations is very, very natural. It's discriminant equation. So, in any number field K, you can start with uh, any fixed uh, integral basis, and then you can write your discriminant. So the discriminant form is written in terms of, uh, uh, so any number alpha can be written as, let's say X1 uh, times one. And I'm gonna assume that my first element here in the integral base is one, you can assume this. And then you have x2 omega 2 and uh, xn omega n. So you can treat x1, x2, xn as variables. It can get any integer, any set of an integer, give you an algebraic integer in your, uh, your ring of integers. But I, uh, you also can write an equation by letting x2, xn, and also x1 as variable. The reason I ignored x1 here is that 
in, in this formula is that it doesn't matter what x1 is, because when you write the discriminant of an element of this shape, you have conjugates, one conjugate minus the other conjugate and so on. So this rational integer just gets canceled when you find these differences. So when you, when you find the, the discriminant of this element, it would be exactly the same as the discriminant of this element. So uh, I don't have to be worried about that. And there would be one fewer variable to think about. So this would define the discriminant form equation, but from very basic algebraic number theory, maybe we remember this formula that the discriminant of any element can be written as the discriminant of the number field that you consider that element in times uh, the index, something that is called the index of that element. And that this formula defines an index form uh, formula for me. So uh, I that I wrote here is the index of your element alpha, and that would be the module index of Z joined alpha in OK. Uh, meaning that if you have Z of alpha and you multiply it, uh, if you have Z of alpha, every other element in your, um, your ring of integer, once it's multiplied to index of alpha, will live in Z of alpha. So that's the meaning of index if, uh, if anybody was not familiar with. So as I said, it's a module index. And that's a, that's a very basic uh, equa uh, equality that you learn in algebraic number theory, probably one of first few lectures. And for that, I'm going back to having that, I'm going back to my discriminant form and write uh, an index form here. So, and, uh, and basically now, if you remember the definition of discriminant, you take every two conjugates, the difference of them, multiply it together and get your discriminant of your number, but then every i and j come together twice, uh, if you count order. So you, you expect to see something square there and that thing is the index of your, uh, your element. Okay, so that way we, we have an index form defined. And, uh, uh, and uh, again, remember that in a number field of degree n that uh, I'm still thinking about the general degree n for index form equation, I do not need to be worried about the first variable, the irrational integer. And I have exactly n minus one variables. And of course the degree is n choose two, just because I have to choose every two different conjugates of my elements and then multiply the differences to each other somehow. But what, what, what is an index form equation in, um, in a cubic number field? It's something that I, I personally like very much. So what you have in a cubic number field is that you have two variables because you have your ring of integer, your, uh, your integral basis as one omega one, omega two, you have two different variables. And then if you wanna, if you wanna see what elements inside your ring of integers have indexed, let's say I, what you would do, you, you look at index form equation equal to I and find those X2, X3 that gives you the coefficients of this. And you, this way you count all elements with index I, right? So, uh, but what is this, uh, this equation? As I said, the significance for me is that it has two variables and it's basically the simplest uh, index form, non-trivial index form you can have. A general number theorist probably listening to that uh, what, how you think about this form probably is that it is actually a norm form equation. What does that mean? It means that, for example, if I'm thinking of omega two, sorry, x, uh, x two omega two plus x three omega three, the index form equation is basically telling me that uh, what, what I have in the index form is norm of this element because uh, not norm of this element, but norm of, um, let's write, I didn't say this very well. So the norm of the difference of uh, whatever you would put, uh, like if, if your alpha was x1 omega one plus x2 
omega two. So you you have the alpha uh, alpha one minus alpha two, and then you go through all the conjugates. So you are calculating the norm of that. So when I'm asking you what what elements or how many solutions this has, I'm asking you somehow to count all the elements of norm i in in number field. So in the number fields that you have. So many of you might think of that as a norm form equation, but that norm form equation is a very, very specific norm form equation, again, because it has two variables. And this is a two equation, which is a special uh, version of norm form equation, or you can think of norm form equation as generalization of that. So let me define two equations for people who might not be familiar, it's a very simple equation. You write a binary form and uh, you can define it for any degree. Uh, let's assume that the degree is at least three because I don't wanna deal with lines or quadratics that can have infinitely many points on them. So I'm gonna assume that these at least three and for simplicity, I'm gonna also assume that my form is irreducible. And in 1909, to approve that if you get a form with coefficients, a form like this with coefficients in uh, integers, and you put it equal to integers and ask how many solutions they have to approve that it had such form has at most finitely many solutions. Again, there might not be any solutions, but if there is, there are finitely many solutions. And once more, I wanna emphasize on the fact that it's in this case, in cubic case for cubic, number fields, when I think about index forms, it's very attractive to have a two equation and to, to say that I just tell you how, how to approve the finiteness in, in this theorem. And again, it's very simple, but if you, if you uh, uh, factorize your form over C, you get something like this, right? And the idea is that if you divide both sides by Y to the Ds, so you get, you get things like alpha one, x over y minus alpha i's and you have y to the d here and a not. So the whole point here is that when you have bunch of things multiplied to each other and giving you a fixed number or a, not necessarily fixed because y can change but a bounded number here, one of these factors here has to be a small and that is the main idea here that one of these x over y as a rational number has to approximate an algebraic number. So once you work with a two a equation or reduce your, your problem to a two a equation, you have a wealth of uh, information that comes from uh, approximations of algebraic numbers by rational. And in general case of index form equations, you have so many variables. So you are not just having one rational uh, approximating one uh, algebraic integer, but in terms of Q, uh, in, in case of cubics, that's, that's where we get lucky and we get an index form equation that is basically a two -way equation. Uh, as I said, there are lots of good results proven for two -way equations and especially for uh, cubic and quartic, we have very good bond, bounds that I'm going to use today. So one of the best bounds that are going to be very helpful eventually for my talk today is due to Mike Bennett, one of the organizers of this series. So um, Mike proved that if you have a cubic to a equation and it's equal to one, then it, uh, it has at most uh, 10 solutions in integers u and v. And there are some results that, that uh, give you better bounds. For example, one of them I wrote here uh, due to Okazaki, uh, who proved that there are at most seven solutions, but to have Okazaki's result, you have to assume that your discriminant is very large. And I worked on that also and just made the discriminant a bit smaller, but uh, to have seven solutions, you have to assume that your discriminant of your cubic F is very large, uh, but um, the, the, the best general bound that we have is really these 10 solutions and uh, I'm gonna use it soon. Uh, one comment I have uh, is that when I define a two equation, I put it equal to number M that is a two equation two that has uh, finitely many solutions. But what we know is that uh, the best techniques that we know for finding the number of 
uh, the number of solutions to a two A equation of the form f u v equal to m is to actually reduce this to bunch of two equations of this form. So if it's equal to one, we have absolute bounds like 10 that I told you here, but if it's equal to M, we can still obtain some bounds, but we have to do some periodic reduction and come down to this bound and naturally we will have dependence on M. So if you don't have M there and equal to one, uh, you, are, you are good because you have absolute bounds uh, and it doesn't matter what the coefficients of your equation or this bound is there. And if, even if you want bounds for M, uh, uh, for general M, you have to go back to one of these things and get your bounds. So, uh, as I said, a very nice thing about uh, cubic index form equations are that you have to, you have to solve basically a two-way equation. Another result that I show you before I move away from cubic equation is a result that I proved while ago. And it was just purely about cubic two equations. And there are better versions of this result. There were better version for negative discriminant. Before I prove this, so I only proved this for positive discriminant. And it's that, it's that if you have a union of two equations, you consider one form, but equal to one, two, all the way to M. And um, if your M is a small enough, you can still get a bound that somehow doesn't depend on your M meaning that it's, uh, you can make your bound absolute. And the way I wrote it, this B of epsilon is very explicit. So for example, if you, if you really want me, I can choose an epsilon, a, sm a positive epsilon here that is a smaller than one over four and just replace that by, for example, the whole thing by 14. Uh, so, I, so what this result on uh, two inequalities of degree three tells me is that if you are in a cubic number field, and uh, you are only looking for, you are looking to count those orders that have, uh, that have index less than D to one over four, you have only finitely many of them and you have only these many, or you can play with your epsilon, but depending on how small you want your, uh, or how big uh, you want your discriminant, uh, your index to be compared to the discriminant of the number field, you can have few, only few and fewer. Uh, 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 sub rings of your ring of integers. So these were just examples to say that in the cubic case, just because the uh, index form equation is a two A equation, we can we can reduce to problems to things that are solved, and we know. For example, let me go back to the previous page. I think that's nice to uh, state. Uh, the first result, Mike's result, that says ten solutions only. Uh, tells me that if you have a, an order, a monogenic order in a cubic number field, that monogenic order can have only at most uh, 10 monogenizers. And Okazaki's result tells me if you give me any monogenic order or any order for that matter, your order can have up to seven monogenizers if, if the discriminant of the number field is big enough. And so, so far we learned that quadratic case is very clear. We know everything about it. Everything is uh, monogenized and uh, unique in a way. Cubic case, most of things are probably not, most of orders are not monogenic, but if they are monogenic, then we know, we know well what happens and what's the upper bound and the number of monogenizers. So the na next natural case is quartic number fields. And that's what, what uh, I'm going to talk about for the rest of my time today. Uh, the next couple of uh, slides are just quick reviews of uh, my definitions that I have already talked about. So uh, I have, uh, just to remind you in the, this setup of quartic number fields, I have a number field. It has, it can have many generators. I, I, I choose one generator, alpha. Uh, and I just make sure that the generator is an algebraic integer so that soon I'm going to look at the order generated by Z of alpha. And my question would be that, okay, this order that I generated, how many other uh, monogenizers it can have? 
And uh, as I said, the idea is that if the index of uh, uh, alpha is I naught, every other algebraic integer, once it's multiplied by I naught, sits in this, in this order. Um, now I wanna show you a theorem that is about index forms. And I wanna recall that I'm not trying to solve index forms today, but we'll realize that solving index form equations can give me some ideas. For example, if you look at an index form equation, x2, x3, x4 in your, uh, in your um, quartic number field and you look at all the solutions, x2, x3, x4, then all the solutions you find would give you all the possible numbers algebraic integers in your ring of integer that has index M. But these whole solutions, even if you can find it in a way, which is very difficult to find, but even if you can find it, this whole solution and then the whole sets of solution, once you find them, you have no idea if they are monogenizers of the same orders or different orders, because you could have different orders of the same index. So, just solving an index form equation would not be enough, but obviously it's related to finding them. So here is a theorem in, from 1996 um, uh, due to Gall, Pito, Post, and I'm pretty sure I do not pronounce the Hungarian names very well, so I apologize. Uh, so this theorem is a purely algorithmic work and they have, and uh, uh, some, uh, some of them uh, have other results related to that. I just picked this uh, particular papers, but they have huge papers. And I think Gall has a book that has several results related to that, basically working on index form equations. Uh, and uh, this result I just picked up because I wanna go through the proof of this and refine it and use it to, to, to count the, the monogenizers. And this only tells me that for any index form, uh, for any index M, algorithmically, how I can hope to find all elements of index M. And uh, what they prove, and I'm going to show you part of the proofs, is that you can start with an index form equation. And remember, if I started with an index form equation, it means that I fixed a uh, an integral base for my number field, and I'm just going to work with that forever. And one of the first element of the integral base is one. So if you want to solve this, then you can reduce the problem to a two equation that is cubic. And it's equal to uh, equal to an integer, which which is which consists of m, the index that you are interested in, but also has index of your generator that you fix in. So it depends what the generator you start with. You start with, but, but that generator would have an index and give you this equation. Once you solve this equation, you have a number of solutions and each of the solutions of the cubic equation uh, uh, comes here and gives you a system of ternary quadratic forms. All along here, everything I have written, there are forms, and by forms, I mean homogeneous form. They, when I say degree, all the terms have the same degree. And I will tell you explicit formulas for Q1 and Q2. So, so the way their, uh, their theorem or even their algorithm works is that they find a solution for the cubic two equation, and they have the same set Q, Q1, Q2 that is fixed and comes from the minimal polynomial, their coefficients coming from the minimal polynomial of your fixed generator alpha, and they make that. And then for every, every solution, they have a system of uh, ternary quadratic equation. And then the next thing they, they use is um, they, they, they talk about a, a result of Mordell and which says, any system of two quadratic ternary equations can be reduced to a quartic two equations. I must say that I'm not sure this is, this is exactly Mordell's work. It could be, but the simplicity of it 
makes me believe that I should do more research in the history. Probably it has been known for a long time. But again, I will, I will show you a parameterizations at the end to convince you that this, the system of two quadratic ternary equations can give you a, a, to a, a, to a quartic to a equation. So before I say more details, which I promised, I haven't defined any of this FQ1 and Q2, I want to say what I'm, I'm going from here. I convinced you that two equations are helpful. And uh, if, if nothing, I'm more comfortable with them. I have worked with them. So my real goal is to take a more complex index form equation that has three variables and understand it through, um, uh, through two equations. So somehow I missed my screen, but I believe that I... All right, so, and in a way, uh, these authors have done the job here, but for index form equations that there's a cubic and then you can make bunch of quartics. But let's go through their proofs. And as I said, I, I don't wanna solve index form equations. I wanna count monogenizers. So let's go see what they are doing. Again, I'm just reviewing what we are dealing with. I have a generator alpha and I fix it. I, I'm going to look at Z joined alpha as an order. Uh, basically, any order you have in the number field, uh, uh, when you, uh, any monogenic order, because it's an order, its generator would be a generator of your number field. So any monogenic order that you know, it, it, it exists. So its generator can be used to, to create your number field over Q. And we have a fixed, um, fixed uh, integral basis for K. And uh, we form this uh, linear form and uh, we define the uh, discriminant form or the discriminant of each element. But once you treat X, Y, Z as uh, X, Y, and Z as um, uh, variables, then you have a discriminant form. We, we, we define the index form here. And let's remind ourselves one thing that is very, very important in their, in their um, proof. That is, if you have an element beta like this, the index form, the way that we, we set it up here, once you plug in beta with the appropriate uh, x, y, z that gives you the beta in the, in the ring of integer, that uh, index form equation gives you exactly the index of your algebraic number beta. So that's the significant thing about index form. So when I'm going back to the situation that I am in and to prove the proof of Gall, Pito, and Post, so uh, I'm here. I'm, uh, the, again, these are all the setup that we have. And I would look at every algebraic number beta that you give me and if I multiply it to the index of alpha I naught, I naught times B has to belong to this order and, and therefore beta prime can be seen as an element of Z of alpha. And that's what they do. They look at the index of this element beta prime and divide it by the index of alpha and that's that, that I to the six that you see here comes from the fact that I naught has been multiplied to every conjugate of beta. And then what they want is that I naught comes from this extra multiplication here. You are looking for things that have index M. They are, they are, they are hoping to, to, uh, to solve index forms like that. And then here you use the monogenizer alpha or the, the generator of number field alpha and that you know that that has index I naught. And this is what they had in their theorem. And again, their, their theorem is supposed to count many more things that I'm interested in. But I wanna find a way to, to find the monogenizers of one thing, but that is not very difficult because if I'm already looking at Z joined alpha, and I'm looking at its monogenizers, any other monogenizer of this ring or this order, first of all, has the same order as uh, alpha because they, they generate the same ring, they have to have the same order. So that tells me, let me write it here, that tells me that in my case, I naught and M have to be equal. Also, it tells me that 
Okay, you can take their proof, but do not worry about multiplying I not your element. Because if you are going to find another monogenizer, the element beta has already, has to be already inside Z of alpha. So I don't need to multiply anything at, uh, by I not. So I get rid of this I not to the six, and my M and I are, are, are going to be equal, so I get one. So again, I, I keep saying I get one. By that, I mean to find the monogenizers, I actually have to do something much simpler. That does, if you only look at their theorem, you can't conclude it from their theorem. But if you go through the proof by knowing that again, alpha and beta creates the, create the same thing and also having the same index, you have the same index, uh, index of beta up here and index of alpha down here then when they are divided by each other, they have to get give you plus one or minus one. And the rest of the things, I'm gonna repeat their theorems, but they're, they're, they're the method of their proof. But again, I got rid of some of their multiplication and the rest are just bunch of, I, uh, I tell you bunch of formulas that are not gonna look pleasant, but they are, um, I mean, when I first learned about them, they're magical to me, they work very nicely. So if you look at this, uh, each of these elements, so remember this was the index of, this is basically my index form equation. So when you look at that, uh, it's not my index form equation, but it's coming from what I know from index form equation, the index of beta divided by alpha. I can look at every element in this product. And the very nice thing is that you can take a common denominator and then you create these roots here and the rest of the coefficients that you see, the rest of the coefficients that you see are symmetric functions in terms of different conjugates of alpha and beta and give you integers. So, and I will write the explicit formula for Q1, Q2 soon for you, but what, uh, and remember this beta, uh, this X, Y, Z are what gave you your beta. That's your beta was X omega two, plus y omega three plus z omega four. So you can think of beta as a lattice point in z of alpha, or in this case, the way I wrote it, actually I looked at it as a lattice point in the integral, uh, in the okay, but also I know that lattice point is in the sub lattice z joint alpha. So I, this x, y, z come from uh, the way we made our index form equation. But what I want to emphasize on is, is this root. So this root, everything, everything is independent of which factor here I'm working with, except this root, but this has a very specific meaning. Well, first of all, maybe uh, some people are familiar with these roots, but if you are not quickly, you can, you can, uh, you can check that this is a cubic element because alpha is uh, quartic, this is cubic. And the way you know it's cubic, if you consider all of its conjugates, it's a very quick combinatorial check that you think about one, two, three, and four, how many ways you can put two of them together and the other two go together. So you fix two, one and you have three choices to pair with one and so on. So this is a cubic element. And the rest of the things that are integers and then integers coefficients with, uh, with uh, again, the variable X, Y, Z. And it repeats in all of the, uh, in all of the other, uh, uh, other, I have to clean up here, in other things in your product here. That I, uh, I know that the product comes to plus one minus one. All right. Uh, as I promised, here are Q1 and Q2. If you, if you have time, you can sit down and figure them out, but there's more history into that. If you start with, uh, again, uh, uh, an element alpha that generates your field and you're also considering this order, uh, I'm gonna assume alpha uh, one, A1, A2, A3, A4 are the, the coefficients of the minimal polynomial of uh, Q of alpha and then uh, my forms Q1 and Q2, as I said, they are all the coefficients are kind of fun symmetric functions of co different conjugates of alpha i basically. They can be written in terms of the coefficients of f. 
little f that is your minimal polynomial. Of course, q1 and q2 would, would be different if I started with another monogenizer, but I started with a monogenizer that I know it exists and, and that helps me create other equation that, uh, that their solutions give me other possible monogenizers. Okay, but what do I have now? Uh, I have this equation. I studied each element in the product and I know that they have this form and I know that I have exactly three of them, three elements here, I, J, K, L, uh, range between one, two, three, four, one, three, four, uh, two, and so on. So there are three options here. And so I am gonna, I'm gonna replace each of these with what I found about them. And Q1 and Q2 are fixed. They are repeating in each of them. So once I multiply them together, if I call, if I call Q, Q1 U and I call Q2 V, I actually made a cubic equation equal to one for myself. And again, because Q1 and Q2 were appearing in every term, that is a, that is a form. And I got a, a two equation plus or minus equal to plus or minus one. Therefore, I can count, I can give an upper bound for the number of solutions of that. Uh, this form F that we, I tried to convince you uh, how you take, how you make it, and I told you what the uh, what the roots are. Um, the roots are basically alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, alpha four, alpha one, alpha three, plus so on. So the three roots, it's it, it has a, it has a meaning. We have a name for it. This is the cubic resolvent of your quartic form, and. It's, it's, it goes back to long, long time ago. So many people use that to find the roots of like when they, they were having a quartic equation and they wanted to find roots and they wanted to find a formula to find their roots, they've, they've worked with resolvent cube, cubic form. So what we found here, as I said, it, it's, it sounds a little bit, at least to me, it was magical, but these are all related and they have been used in the history to do a lot of things with quartic forms. So this form happens to be your cubic resolvent form. There are lots of things you can check very quickly, especially now that you know if the roots of your little f, the minimal polynomial is alpha and its conjugates, obviously, what the roots of uh, capital F would be. Uh, and you can calculate the discriminant. A very nice property of cubic resolvent form is that it preserves the discriminant. It's, it has the same discriminant as your original number alpha and it's minimal polynomial. And so therefore you, uh, you got from uh, an alpha with discriminant D to a cubic two equations of the same discriminant. Uh, this, what I'm going to say here is repeat, but I just want to remind ourselves what I did. I went through this uh, theorem and basically through its proof. And I said that, okay, I'm not really completely interested in index form equation. So I'm interested in beta equal to X omega two plus Y omega three plus z omega four, such that it's in z of alpha. And then it's, uh, it's so if and only if there is a solution uv to this, and then I got rid of this and replaced it by one. Okay, now I have here a cubic to a equation and you don't have to be worried about plus one minus one. Basically if x and y is a solution to uh, f equal to plus one minus x minus y would be a solution to f equal to negative one. You're in a cubic case, so you can count them. So basically I know how many u and v possibly can be solutions to this. And then the rest of the theorem or the proof I didn't really touch yet. And I know that I get a system of uh, quadratic ternary um, forms. And uh, also they, uh, the, the the paper of Gall, Pito, and Post tells me that you can reduce them to quartics, which I'm happy about. But the thing, the problem is that 
I can reduce them to quartic two equations and that gives me finiteness results that we already have. But how do I count the number of solutions? Because if I have a quartic, uh, so Q, let's write it G actually. If G of X and Y is equal to M, then okay, I can give a, an upper bound for that, but the upper bound, the upper bound for that, I mean the upper bound for the number of solutions, integer solutions of that. But my upper bound would depend on M. So if I have any M hat ap appearing here, I need to know what M can be here. Also, I know my best upper bounds is are for one, so I'm gonna try to make that one. But that wouldn't be that M equal to one, and that's the last part of my modification to their proof, uh, which is these, uh, these systems that I create here give me quartic two equations that are exactly equal to plus minus one. Here is, here is how they tell me you can parameterize it, but uh, and that's what it's uh, written in the Diophantine equation book by Mordell. So I tried that. Remember, one thing that I should have emphasized is that that uv, f of uv, that was the cubic resolvent form, was, was monic. So the first coefficient had one as the, the first coefficient, the leading coefficient was one, and the rest were written um, in terms of... Uh, some functions of uh, coefficients of little f, the minimal polynomial. But this first coefficient being uh, one tells me that I have a very one, ob uh, a very uh, obvious solution for sure, which is one and zero. If I put one and zero in this, I get number one back here, right? So that ha that is one of my uh, trivial solutions. And if I, uh, I didn't rewrite Q1 for you, it was more complicated. But I looked at Q2, the, and so Q1 has to be equal to one, Q2 has to be equal to zero. And again, if I follow uh, their ideas or Mordell's ideas, basically I can parameterize by, by having this equal to zero and I, I'm parameterizing X, Y, and Z. And I introduce two new parameters, P and Q, which are not primes, that's just, I ran out of names. So P and Q are two new parameters, so everything how I parameterize this. Basically the method is try to write it as the sum of three squared, but here in this very trivial case of equal to zero, you do very basic divisibility argument. If Z is zero, everything else vanishes except Y, and uh, then Y has to be zero. If Z is not zero, you just uh, prove that Z has to be uh, a square and so on, and you parameterize based on two. And now the idea is that your X and Y and Z, in order to satisfy Q2 equal to zero, they have to satisfy exactly these three, three um, um, parameterizations. And these parameterizations is very important to, to note that each of them is a quadratic form in P and Q as, as variables, right? So when I plug in those back to Q1, I get uh, I, uh, Q1 was already a quadratic form in three variables, but each of three variables is a, is a quadratic form itself in P and Q. So Q1 of these three things would be a quartic form, binary form, and that got to be equal to one. So I got a two -way equation, which is quartic this time, and is equal to one. And that is something that I worked on for many years. So I have different bounds. So one of the bounds, the best bounds that I have is that a quartic two equation equal to plus or minus one can have at most 26 solutions in this case in P and Q integer. But in that case, you have to take your, your discriminant very big. If you don't want to take your discriminant that big, I'm looking, I wrote the, the uh, if you don't want to take that, your discriminant that big, I can uh, still come up with another, I think, I, I don't remember it, I thought I wrote a note, I think 700 something, if, if you don't want to assume this has big discriminant, then uh, the bounds are not, are not uh, believed to be um, sharp, but but they are, they are, they exist and they are, they, they hold. So that's an upper bound for the number of solutions to quartic equal to one. And the significant of what happened here with the solution one and zero 
was that I could I could use the bounds that I already proven for quartic forms equal to one. But how about other solutions? You know what? It's not a problem because other solutions of f of u and v equal to one. Remember, this is your cubic because the, it has to come to one if you have if you get a solution that is non-trivial. It's not one and zero. It's u not and v not because it's a solution of this equal to one. A combination of that has to has to a linear combination of that has to give you one. So instead you would consider S Q1 plus T Q2 equal to one and then Q1 plus, okay, I wanna say minus V naught Q1 plus U naught Q2 equal to zero. But what I had, I had Q1 and Q2 equal to U naught, V naught, each of Q1 and Q2 were ternary quadratic form, but with these variables that I can find S and T and uh, U naught and V naught that they were my, my variables, I uh, my solutions to cubic two equations, I made a new system of ternary, uh, two ternary quadratics that is one and zero again. So again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to a, I'm going to get to a quartic two equation. So let me summarize what I said. I said that you start with the minimal polynomial of alpha. You can write a cubic, that is the cubic resolvent form of your minimal polynomial of alpha. You have to solve this equal to one. And you know you have at most 10 solutions here. And then once you have you solved it for one, for every solution like one and zero, u naught v naught, for every solution you can find a system. Of quadratic uh, ternary forms, and you can translate that system to one and zero, and that would be that would give you a quartic. Uh, quartic uh, two equation. So the conclusion is that I count how many solutions this has, the cubic two equation, and I count how many solutions each of each of quartic can have. But since the bounds that we have for quartic is uniform, doesn't doesn't matter um, what quartic or what quartic forms we are working with. So I take the number of solutions. For, or I shouldn't say the number of solutions, the upper bound for the number of solutions to a cubic to a times the upper bound for the number of solutions to a quartic to a equation. And for those we had bounds. And uh, 10, for, for example, 10 times 26 is 260. So this is, there is at most 260 uh, monogenizers of a quartic. Uh, index form. Uh, I know that I'm running out of time, so I apologize for running late, but I want to say something, especially for the expert, a very nice feature of um, uh, reducing to two equations rather uh, on top of having better bounds for cubic and quart quartic is that, uh, of course, you have uh, the methods coming from linear forms in logarithm that tells you where these solutions can be. I mean, these are not sharp, but, but they are effective. So, and my solutions, eventually my solutions like P and Q at the end can tell me where X, Y, Z were, uh, like what X, Y, Z can be. So for that reason, I can use the methods that, that tells me something about the height of the solutions to, uh, to, to equations to derive results, how, how big the height of a monogenizer can be, especially with respect to the discriminant. And I think that's where I end. Thank you.